Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first Tech Talk of 2022. I feel very honored to be the uh, first one to go this year. Um, I'm hoping for a much better year this year, and I'm sure even better science. So I'm going to talk today briefly about uh, cell ultrastructure and preservation. I'd like to um, not spend too much time on uh, the slides and give you an opportunity for lots of uh, Q&A if, if you have any. Um, so if you know me, I'm always running around campus and you know my research focus is just as scattered, right? So I'm doing hybrid stuff, we're doing bio, we're doing um, more solid materials. Um, and for the last several years, I've been focused mostly on the hybrid aspect of things. Um, and you know we've learned a lot about sample prep and all sorts of uh, aspects of that. So I just wanted to go over that um, briefly with everyone here today. And okay. Uh, so I'm Eric Roth. Uh, I'm the EM specialist uh, with the BioCryo facility. My office is in uh, B535, not B545, um, but uh, I'm rarely in there. So if you have any issues, you can uh, give me a call on my cell phone, even on the weekends or in the evenings. I'm happy to help. Uh, it's really important to me that the microscopes are all working and the equipment's all working for everybody. You know, the worst thing you can do is just ignore a problem. Um, please don't feel bashful to call me. It, it, you're not going to be in trouble if something is broken. You know, I, I understand things happen, and, and I just I just want everything to be working. Um, so let's see. Before I begin, I just wanted to give everyone a quick update. Um, if you are on new core, you may have noticed that we have the stem blocked off uh, most of next week. Um, we are hoping to have the uh, EDS system upgraded next week. We, it was supposed to happen a, a few weeks ago. Uh, we were lacking a piece of hardware that they, they neglected to ship. Um, so we've got that hardware now um, and uh, Thermo will be on site next week along with Hitachi. Um, so hopefully by the end of that week, we'll have a brand new system. Uh, these are solid state detectors. Um, they should have much higher count rate. Um, they're gonna be very good with like low element, uh, low Z element um, as, as well as you know, the regular, like you know, gold will be easy as well, uh, but will be really good for looking at you know, something like uh, phosphor. Uh, phosphorus. Um, the resolution will be about on par with what we have now, uh, but we won't need to use any liquid nitrogen since these are solid state detectors. Um, not that I make anybody add liquid nitrogen anyways, but I won't have to deal with that. So that'll be a bonus. Um, okay. So if you have any questions, please uh, go ahead and throw them in the chat. Uh, everybody knows how to use Zoom by now. We've all been living by this uh, for the last couple of years. Um, the topics I'm going to cover today are uh, basic cell ultrastructure and organelles as seen by TEM. Um, you know, it's a little bit different than the cell models we all learned from. Um, I'm also going to go over cell death um, and uh, sample prep artifacts. Um, you know, when we have a hybrid uh, material, um, lots of cells don't like materials. You know, so we uh, might have interactions, and how can we tell the difference if our cell is not happy? or if maybe we just didn't prepare it correctly. So that's uh, the basics of what we're gonna cover here. Okay. Um, so, you know, material uh, biointerfaces, um, you know, there's all sorts of things. You know, if you're a material scientist, you might be a hybrid material scientist without even realizing it. Um, all sorts of things can be considered hybrids. Uh, you know, cancer drugs can use heavy metals. Um, we have uh, in that second kind of image there uh, in the middle, uh, these are polymer coated, po pardon me, polymer coated nanoparticles. Uh, which you know with TEM we can't typically see uh, in our stem. If we have our SE detector, so we can highlight that polymer shell and light up the uh, dense core. Um, food, a lot of food are, are considered hybrid materials. Here we have gum that was, was done with our cryo SEM. On the left, there's the hard candy shell, and on the uh, the right is the soft gum material itself. Um, tissue engineering is a really hot thing right now, especially at Northwestern. There's a lot of cool tissue engineering projects going on here. Um, this was a collaboration I was involved with on the bottom there with all the numbers over there or the letters over it. Um, this was a 3D printed hydrogel matrix and we were growing a, a mouse ovary in it. Um, so again, we've got our, our material, our uh, biological aspect to it. Um, and it doesn't have to be bio either. So uh, the image on the bottom right, we've got nanoparticles, but that's with hydrogel, right? So we were working with, uh, like this, again, this is cryo SEM. Um, and you know, in the little white dots there, those are our little nanoparticles that you can see. Um, so all sorts of things uh, that are really important for hybrid materials uh, research. Okay, there we go. All right, so um, as I mentioned before, you know, 
what are we looking at when we're looking at cells in EM? It looks very, very different from the models that we all learned on, or well, some of us learned on. Uh, I didn't learn these in school. I didn't go to very good high school, but um, a lot of times when I'm working with a researcher, you know, I'll they'll say, you know, I, I know what I'm looking for. Uh, I don't know what I'm seeing here though. What, what's, what are these cells? What's inside of these? Um, and a lot of people are very surprised to learn uh, what things look like. Um, so I'll go over just the basics of uh, the morphology of what you might see in a cell in TEM or even in SEM um, and some of the functions. So, you know, we've got the nucleus, we've got the um, ER and the ribosomes, uh, Golgi, digestive bodies, mitochondria, cell membranes and junctional complexes, as well as the centrioles. Uh, those are my favorites. Okay, so I'm just gonna start off with the cytoplasm. Um, cytoplasm is a, a fond term, uh, you might've heard ectoplasm that was uh, uh, usurped by uh, Ghostbusters, but it, it's actually just the stuff inside of cells. And when we refer to the cytoplasm, we're usually referring to everything outside of the nucleus, although the nucleus itself is considered an organelle. So really all the stuff inside the cells is you know, within the cytoplasm. So we're seeing all sorts of uh, organelles here, here. We'll talk about what those are in a bit, uh, but those are within the cytoplasm. So uh, you know, we can see all these tiny little dots in there. Um, and a lot of them are kind of grouped. So we have like kind of like a little tetramer there um, and some trimers. Um, and those are what we call the ribosomes. And so we'll talk about that more later but you'll see that the majority of the cytoplasm is composed of these ribosomes. Okay, so the nucleus, um, you know, what does the nucleus do, right? Well, we all know the nucleus is, you know, where we have all, all the DNA and the chromosomes. Um, you know, in a very active cell, like the cell on the right, um, you're gonna see a lot of euchromatin where it's a very light kind of uh, whitish, uh, light gray area, as opposed to the heterochromatin, um, in the, the kind of darker area here. Um, in this cell on the left, which is not quite as active, we can see uh, the uh, heterochromatin lined up along the edge of the uh, nuclear uh, membrane. And where we have little breaks in the uh, chromatin, you see there's actually gonna be a nuclear pore there. So there's little holes in the uh, nucleus uh, to allow for uh, transport of well, ribosomes for the most part. Uh, the nucleolus uh, has the RNA in it, and that plays a big role in uh, with the development of ribosomes. Um, and so we don't need to go into too much detail here, but just so you know what you're seeing. And I mean, of course, nuclei are, are the most obvious thing. You can see those with light microscopy, uh, but they look a little different in EM. Okay, so here's a, a quick question. You know, when we're looking at EM, uh, we're looking at ultra thin sections of tissue. Uh, what we're seeing here on the left, this is a, uh, a cell that was, well, a group of cells from tissue, uh, from ovary, mouse ovary, that was sectioned. So when we're in the uh, TEM, everything has to be electron transparent. The tissue here was uh, sliced with a diamond knife uh, at a thickness of about 80 nanometers. And so if you can imagine, uh, we've got a cell that's, say, 20 microns uh, in diameter, and we're only taking out a very tiny slice of that. And so where's the nucleus in this cell? Well, we probably just didn't section through it. Uh, we may be in a different part of the cell. The nucleus may be on top of that or, or beneath uh, where we have sectioned. So if you see a cell without a nucleus uh, in EM, uh, you know, worry not, it's probably there. Uh, we're just not seeing it. Uh, that is one of the biggest issues I think with EM is the, the magnification and scale in which we're zoomed in on. Um, EM is not a very good tool for saying if something is or isn't there just because we don't see it. You know, we are trying to explain a park by looking at a blade of grass. You know, we're on the nanoscale here. Um, okay, so onto our next organelle, uh, the uh, stemming from the nucleus, uh, it shares um, an opening with the endoplasmic reticulum. So we have rough endoplasmic reticulum and smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, the way that you can identify uh, rough ER from smooth ER is the presence of ribosomes. So you'll see we have, this is our, our rough ER here uh, in the, within the red brackets. You can kind of see these little dots lined up along those and those are the ribosomes that are lined up with the um, uh, rough uh, endoplasmic reticulum. Um, what's happening here is that we're, we're producing proteins uh, with the ribosomes. Um, the ribosomes, again, they float freely within the cytoplasm, uh, but also uh, within the RER. Um, 
with the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, uh, let's see here. You can actually see a little hint of it here. Uh, well, there's some ribosomes there, um, perhaps here and there. Uh, that's responsible for producing uh, fats or lipids uh, for cells, which are you know, really important. Uh, here is actually a, lip, a liposome right there. It's this kind of light gray. Here's another one there and there. All right, so those are produced uh, by the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Next up, we have the Golgi. Uh, it was debated for a while whether the Golgi was actually an organelle. Uh, we know now that it is and has its own function separate from the uh, endoplasmic reticulum. The uh, Golgi, uh, when I was learning about this, my friend called it the candy factory. I always called it the takeout restaurant of the cell. Um, so the, the function of the Golgi is to uh, modify um, package and transport proteins. So we, we intake uh, ribosomes into the uh, Golgi and the uh, Golgi is able to uh, kind of analyze the data in there and, and say, okay, are we, uh, do we have the right combination of amino acids uh, and do we need to modify that in order to produce the protein that we need? Um, so, you know, we've got the ingredients from the ribosomes coming into the Golgi. Uh, the Golgi does its thing and then it uh, packages and delivers them uh, within vesicles that are transported to other parts of the cell. And so you can kind of see here the process of it going in. So here's a little bit of rough ER going through the process. And then here's our little vesicles. And those are going to go off into, uh, you know, Grubhub is going to deliver those to wherever it's needed. Um, so that's the Golgi. All right. Uh, it's actually a really pretty organelle. One of my favorites that it's fine in a cell. Because then we go to the digestion. Um, so cells, you know, they need to intake nutrients. And of course, they have excess nutrients and they need to get rid of those as well. So we have what are called digestive bodies um, within the uh, cell. And you'll see these kind of floating around in the cytoplasm. Um, we've got nutrients that enter. Um, there's this thing called clathrin-mediated endocytosis. I couldn't find this in any of my uh, data, but there's uh, what you'll see in uh, the cells, there's a little invagination that, that occurs. And sometimes you'll find that there's like a chunk of some protein or something in there. And it, it engulfs that into uh, the cytoplasm into little vesicles. So here we can see these are called endosomes. So endosomes work their way out through the system into ex uh, exosomes. Um, so we, where they're digested um, and uh, the nutrients are uptaken into the cell. Uh, when we have excess uh, nutrients, those are uh, uh, transported out through the lysosomes and um, the autophagosomes. So we have, in addition to nutrients uh, and, and uh, molecules and things we don't need, there's also uh, dead organelles, things that are no longer functional, such as mitochondria. So here we can see kind of in this like double membrane area here, this was probably a mitochondria at one point that's being digested um, through the process and that'll be spit out. You might see um, artifacts, that, well, not artifacts, but features that kind of look like myelin. Um, so autophagosome, another word for that is a myelinic figure. So we see kind of a twisty, a uh, little layered, like multiple membrane layered structure there uh, within the, uh, the vesicle. Okay, so digestive bodies are gonna, you're gonna find those all over the cells. Another thing you'll usually find all over the cells, especially in really active um, cells, such as, you know, I have written down here, cardiac muscle, but you know, liver, kidney, um, these are all vital functions um, that require lots and lots of energy. Um, so the mitochondria, um, you will find those in all sorts of cells. And in fact, even in the most boring cell, uh, stem cells, which usually only contain a nucleus, uh, cytoplasm, and maybe you'll see one or two mitochondria uh, floating around in there. Um, still really interesting cell, but they're just blank slates. If you ever get to work with them, they're kind of cool. Uh, but these are mitochondria. So mitochondria, uh, their defining feature are these cristae. Uh, so these kind of double membrane features that line up along the edge. Um, they have sort of pockets. These are kind of an unusual uh, mitochondria from a tissue, but um, you might see in there, uh, see, there's a little density there. So these are little calcium plus ions uh, that exist. So the mitochondria uh, function is that it uptakes glucose, uh, transport, or transforms it into ATP uh, to give the cell energy. So uh, that's the basic of uh, mitochondria. You know, they're the powerhouse of the cell as they call them. Because then we go on to uh, the cell membrane, which uh, you've seen the cell membrane, that's the membrane that holds in the cell, uh, but as well as junctional complexes and cytoskeleton. Um, so we're not usually looking at just a cell. We're looking at cells in tissue and they're all butted up against each other and what's happening in there in between them. Well, you'll see little uh, 
features uh, in the cell. So we have uh, two cells here, one there and one here. A little bit different densities in the cytoplasm, so it makes it easier to see. And you can see a double membrane feature going all along up and down here. So where we have uh, densities, you can see here and there, these are what we call our desmosomes. So desmosomes um, go all around the cell, which is why we can usually see them. It's kind of like, like a belt, um, kind of like the tight junction here, uh, which is just exists usually right above it um, at the edge of the cell. And uh, the desmosome is connected by actin filaments and actin filaments are part of the cytoskeleton. So when we say cytoskeleton, we're talking about um, actin filaments, we're talking about intermediate filaments, um, we're talking about microtubules, and these um, fiber-like uh, features are what kind of uh, hold our cells uh, in place together uh, like, a, uh, like a skeleton. You know, they, that's why we call it like a cytoskeleton. I mean, they're not, obviously they're not bone-ish, but they hold the cell together. Um, I was working with somebody that uh, completely extracted the membranes from red blood cells at one point. And that was a really interesting um, project because we were able to see how the um, actin um, and the proteins connected um, to form sort of a, a crystalline almost um, uh, form of, to make up the red blood cell um, so that you know, it doesn't, so it maintains its form. Um, so there's, there's a lot of going on in there more than just a membrane. Um, we have the uh, uh, adherence junction, which is kind of a tighter area. Here you'll see a kind of a, a looser opening there, right? So we've got some vesicles being uh, transported either out of a cell or between the cells. So the um, uh, junctional complexes allow for uh, communication and transport of ions between cells. Um, you know, if you've got, say, for example, muscle cells, right, they all work in conjunction with one another and they're sending signals to one another and, and uh, moving one after another, especially in the cardiac uh, tissue, as I was saying earlier. Um, so the, the, uh, in this SEM image here, uh, this was a project I worked on quite a while ago, the cell, the um, outer cell membrane and most of the contents were actually extracted from this cell. We're still left with the nucleus. But what was left behind, this is all cytoskeleton. So this is mostly actin. Um, and so you can see, uh, you know, we don't really see it much in TEM, uh, but there is a lot of it there and it's, it's very, very important. Uh, it's just not a very dense feature, so it doesn't really uh, light up very much with our stains. Okay, so this you may or may not ever see in your career if you're working with cells, uh, centrioles or the centrosome. There's only one in the cell. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, when I was talking about where's the nucleus, right, we're, we're sectioning a very thin part of a huge cell, and the odds of actually sectioning through uh, a, a centriole, let alone a pair of centrioles, uh, to form, see the centrosome itself um, is, is very rare indeed. So uh, anytime I see them, I, you know, I take a quick shot just for fun. Um, so this is what the uh, centrosome looks like. It's a pair of centrioles. So these are usually um, nine uh, kind of cylinder-like uh, they're made up of microtubules, or we, uh, they call it tubulin, is what it's, it's made up of. And so the centrioles or the centrosome play a vital role in uh, cell division or mitosis. Again, these are very, very rare to see. If you ever see one, uh, grab a snapshot. They're, they're a really beautiful feature within the cell. Uh, okay. All right, so cell death. You know, when we're working with um, cells in uh, a hybrid situation, especially something like uh, uh, hydrogel, or um, some sort of an interface, perhaps gold or wafer or something. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to say um, how your cells are gonna behave under certain situations, if you're exposing them to certain conditions. And so you may see a lot of cell death uh, in the early stages. Um, so you'd let, it's important to know what you're seeing um, because uh, different types of cell death are sparked by different uh, conditions. There's all sorts of cell death and they're discovering new ones all the time. Um, the three most common are in bold here. So we have apoptosis, um, autophagocytosis, and necrosis. There are a couple others, uh, paraptosis and uh, parthenatos, which are um, somewhat similar to apoptosis. Uh, they have uh, different um, causes and different routes of death. Um, but it's, it's rather unusual to see that. Um, some of the other more unusual ones is um, entosis, where one cell consumes another. 
Um, we have um, hyperphagia where that doesn't go so well. Um, so <laughs> the cell eats a cell, usually an apeptotic one, uh, and they say it's a death from indigestion. So <laughs> that's kind of an interesting way that cells might die. Um, catastrophic uh, mitosis failure, uh, that's a term that's still being uh, trying to be defined on, on what exactly that should be called. Uh, but basically, it's, it's a, a failure of, of a cell division. Um, necrosis is not considered a programmed death. However, it's recently been discovered that some uh, necrosis can uh, be sparked uh, by signaling um, to kind of uh, create a barrier between, say, like a virus infection and, and the tissue. Uh, so it's kind of like uh, brush burning to prevent forest fires. <clears throat> Excuse me, that's a very recent discovery. Uh, but necrosis itself, um, you know, is, is cell death by unnatural means. We'll go over that uh, more here in a minute. Okay, so I started with her. Okay, I meant to start with apoptosis. Um, we'll, we'll go ahead to apoptosis. So apoptosis is a programmed cell death. Um, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, it is very important, actually. Um, when embryos are developing, um, apoptosis is critical for when um, fingers interdigenate or interdigate. So, it, you know, when we start out with something like this and the cells between die off and so then we're left with fingers. Um, so this is sparked by chemical events uh, from nearby cells. Um, and uh, what happens is you'll see, start to see these um, bodies form and we get these densities uh, within the cell. So these are the key features to look out for um, in your cells if you're concerned about them dying. Um, you know, here we have a more or less a normal cell, right? And then so, but that, not so good, right? So this is a white blood cell, uh, the stein. I believe uh, this is a, um, I forget what that one was. Um, so see, yeah, so we have a, a fragmented uh, nucleus, um, swollen mitochondria. Uh, I think I have images of that later. Uh, here's the membrane plebbing, right? So we've got these. And so basically what happens is the cell fragments apart. Um, so this is kind of a mid-stage up here. Um, whereas uh, in late stage, it's just, it kind of, uh, if you imagine um, a bunch of water floating through space and it kind of breaking up into smaller pieces. Um, so that's, that's what's happening in apoptosis, at least from a morphological standpoint from what you might see in, under the EM. Okay, so uh, paraptosis is kind of a more unusual form of uh, apoptosis. Here we see a very swollen uh, ER. So this is our endoplasmic reticulum and see how it's got such a wide kind of uh, area in there. So that's kind of our, our early indicator um, of uh, perips, uh, paraptosis. Um, so this is another uh, programmed cell death. The cell uh, eventually lyses in its final stage. Um, and so it results in inflammation. So it's another form of signaling, right? Um, we get uh, big vacuoles that form in the cytoplasm and it gets worse over time and, and eventually the whole thing kind of disintegrates. Um, okay, so uh, this brings up onto autophagy or autophagocytosis, um, which is a, so there's, there's two things going on here, right? So we have a natural um, autophagocytosis, which is part of the digestive system. But um, so autophagy is when the cell actually consumes itself. So it, it acts like it's, it's a, a, a giant digested digestion. Um, so this is a programmed cell death. Um, this is a, usually a response to stress or disease or infection. Um, not so much part of the plan like apoptosis. Um, so what we're looking for in uh, the cell to identify it or, or uh, from say apoptosis, different types of cell death um, is the uh, organelles in the cytoplasm. Um, you know, we might see um, mitochondria that are just kind of dense and, and blah. Um, we've got uh, excess proteins uh, kind of in vesicles. And here we can see, right? So this is what I was talking about, the myelinic figures and some densities. Um, we've got a huge gap here, big swollen area with the um, uh, nucleus, the nuclear envelope. Um, so that's, you know, that, that's not happy there. Um, so eventually this cell is, is, you know, going to the graveyard here. Um, so this uh, plays a critical role in uh, homeostasis of the cells um, and helps to present, uh, pardon me, prevent mutations as well. So um, sometimes if a cell detects something's wrong uh, going on, then it will uh, consume itself so that it prevents uh, further spreading of that, uh, which, you know, is kind of the issue with cancer, right? That's, it's not, they're not dying. They're not going to, they just keep producing, 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 right? So that's uh, uh, 
deficiency in cancer cells. Uh, get with it, cancer cells. You gotta, you gotta eat yourselves. Um, so on to necrosis. Necrosis is, uh, when you see necrosis in cells, you'll know it because everything's extracted. Um, we're looking at the surface of um, a, uh, some uh, tissue in cross-section here. And so this is um, uh, the um, epithelial cells. And you can, there's actually no cell membrane here. All right, This is the uh, nucleus we're seeing here. Um, we've got actually a little bit of a cell membrane here, some leftovers from a cell next to it. Um, and then there's these uh, vesicles just kind of floating around right on the surface here, uh, not being bound by anything. So this is a late stage necrosis. And what necrosis is, is usually cell death through damage, right? So if you have um, cells that are completely lacking nu uh, nutrients, um, uh, exposed tissue, you know, will, will uh, become necrotic tissue. Um, and so that's a very dangerous thing for people to experience. Uh, but on the cellular level, uh, this is what we're seeing uh, within uh, a necrosis. So if you experience necrosis, if you see necrosis in your uh, hybrid system, um, that's either a result of poor handling of, of your, uh, your tissue. Um, perhaps, you know, you, you, you scraped it, you bumped it while you were trying to work with it. Um, or it could be uh, indicative of the cells really not liking your, your surface, your, your interface, your hybrid interface. Um, so we're looking for, again, vacuoles, uh, swollen mitochondria. Here we can see, this is a mitochondria here. Uh, this is not, you know, we're not seeing the cristae like normal. They're, they're all kind of blebbed out there. Um, uh, the cytoplasm, which is what's left over in the cell here, is completely extracted, right? We don't see really any ribosomes. Looks like there's maybe one tiny one there. Um, we're seeing hardly any uh, chromatin uh, chromosomes left over in uh, the nucleus. Um, sometimes in early stages, uh, we have a nucleus that actually looks normal. Uh, and that's usually the last thing that's left over during necrosis. So that, that uh, what we have left there is just you know, empty cytoplasm with a nucleus that looks okay. Um, so you can tell also that is a sign of necrosis. Okay, so how are we to know all right, did we, did we have dead cells there? Are our cells not liking our, our, our surface, our, our interface? Or did we just not prepare them correctly? Right, Because when we're going into the electron microscope, there's a whole slew of processes that are necessary prior to uh, imaging, right? We can't put just a wet cell into an EM. We have a vacuum system there. Um, it will outgas, it will disrupt it and destroy it. Um, so several of the means that we take for uh, preserving uh, our tissue and our hybrid models um, we do a lot of cryogenic work, right? So we have, if we have a, a cell um, with um, hydrogel uh, type of a situation there, we might refer to cryo or perhaps high pressure freezing with cryo. Um, we may, uh, you know, for our initial models, just go for uh, traditional chemical processing. And there's a lot of things that can go wrong with that as well. And of course, physically, you know, mishandling our samples, right? If we've got a piece of tissue and we're mounting that to our SEM stub, there's a Big chance we could, you know, destroy it there. Uh, they're very, very sensitive uh, uh, samples. Um, so if we're processing and we're using uh, the incorrect buffer, um, if you're processing cells or tissues, you'll see lots of protocols out there. Um, I would recommend when you're in your your phase of, of trying to design your experiment to really figure out what buffers are optimal for different. Uh, tissues or different cells. Um, don't just throw PBS in your fixative because that will often result in disaster. In fact, PBS is a really bad uh, buffer for, for most situations anyway, sometimes it's okay. Usually we're using like a cacodylate or a pipus buffer um, and some tissues require very, very specific buffers. Um, I was working with platelets at one point and we found that there's this specific buffer called White's buffer solution um, that has a, a very unique formula to it. Um, and it works, it's exclusively for, um, it's exclusively for platelets. And so using other buffers with platelets uh, will always, will often result in disaster as well with that. Um, so that's, you know, things that have been worked out decades ago that people have um, uh, realized, okay, buffers play an important role. Fixation is also a really important thing. If our uh, tissue is too large, uh, our fixative isn't going to get in there. Um, we won't have proper uh, secondary fixation, 
we won't have proper um, dehydration. It's a cascading problem. So if one thing goes wrong in chemical processing, everything down the line, uh, it will also not uh, behave as you want it to. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go on to uh, describing some of these. So when we're doing cryogenic work, um, so here we have a cell that's uh, been uh, grown and suspended within a hydrogel matrix. Um, on the image on the right, we have kind of a zoom in of that. So this is all of this thing surrounding the cell and out here, this is our hydrogel. And here we can see, so this is one of my first experiments with uh, high pressure freezing, um, utilizing cells with um, hydrogels. I think we just had too much bulk material here. Um, when we're working with a high pressure freezer, we have a good 50, maybe, um, maybe 100 microns worth of good freezing. It's usually less than that, maybe 20 to 50, uh, everything on the outside of that. And so um, this was probably more in the middle. And so when I sectioned through, um, I saw, okay, this cell um, probably used to be happy, right? Uh, it kind of looks like an necrotic cell, um, but we're missing some of the key characteristics there. So it, it became a necrotic cell, but mostly because of uh, freezing uh, artifacts. So when we're freezing a sample, if we don't do it fast enough, we get, instead of amorphous ice, we get crystalline ice. And this ice, uh, you know, when it crystallizes, it, it rips apart uh, our membranes, it rips apart our morphology of uh, our, our tissues or our cells, uh, especially if we go in the other direction of thawing, uh, that's even slower and much, much worse. Um, so we take several steps to um, ensure that this usually doesn't happen. Um, but I think I save all of my data and it, it's, it's really good to be able to look back and see what artifacts are, are look like. Um, okay, so yeah, we have our membranes were preserved, that's about it. Um, not much else looks good in the cell. All right, so chemically, chemical processing artifacts. Usually when we're fixing cells or tissue, we're using both glutaraldehyde and paraformaldehyde. Paraformaldehyde does a very good job on the bulk um, level. So, you know, you've got um, a big chunk of tissue, you know, it, from the hospital or something like that. They'll, they'll usually put it in formaldehyde what we call paraformaldehyde when we make it up. Um, when we want to preserve cellular ultrastructure, though, in organelles, uh, we use a, a different aldehyde called glutaraldehyde. Glutaraldehyde is what does a great job fixing you know, the, the mitochondria, the membranes, uh, everything inside the cell. When we don't use glutaraldehyde, uh, we don't get very good preservation of our cells. Sometimes it is necessary, though. So in this image on the left, we're seeing um, an immunogold labeling situation. We cannot use glutaraldehyde or much glutaraldehyde um, when we're doing immunolabeling experiments because that will destroy our antibody reactions. Um, so here we have a cell that was fixed just with paraformaldehyde. And what we're seeing is a lack of membranes. So if we look back at our other cells, we'll see at densities here. Whereas here, it's almost a negative impression. So this is like the nuclear envelope um, and we're just seeing a gap here. And so with the, um, uh, what we have here is a mitochondria, right? We're not seeing those nice cristae and the nice kind of dense border around the mitochondria. It's actually a negative uh, impression. So a lack of membranes is uh, indicative of perhaps poor fixation um, if you did not penetrate your, your tissue well or your, your, your sample well. Um, the rule of thumb for processing tissues uh, in EM is uh, about one millimeter by one millimeter cubed. Um, you can go long, you can be like a matchstick. So one millimeter by one millimeter by like five millimeters, but our penetration volume of, especially the glutaraldehyde is not, not a, a huge uh, amount of tissue. Um, so again, the paraformaldehyde does a great job with bulk stuff. That's really important, especially if you're doing uh, tissue and not cells. Um, but if we have uh, too big of a, a chunk of tissue, uh, we get what I call the frozen turkey effect, right? We, we have everything's burnt on the outside and, and frozen on the inside, but we don't have a good situation with that. Um, on the uh, right here, we have um, some artifacts from uh, pore fixation. So what we're seeing here is extraction of the cytoplasm. Um, so we, this, this is either excessive dehydration um, or, and or pore fixation. And we're actually seeing some other features in here as well, which I'll talk about in my next slide. Um, so heavy metal precipitates can also be an issue, especially if you're doing immunolabeling, right? What's your gold? What's, what's going on here? Um, when we're doing EM on tissues, 
We're usually, after uh, the aldehydes, we're doing a post fixation with osmium tetroxide and often uh, with urinal acetate as well. Our, our contrasting uh, method in EM is not, we're not putting like stain, we're not putting pigment on our, our, our cells. Uh, we're using heavy metals so that the electron beam can interact with that and create some contrast. Um, the heavy metals are vital or we won't really see anything. Um, osmium is one of the uh, most heavily used uh, uh, post fixatives uh, for um, uh, tissues. Um, osmium does a great job with myelin. So right here we have, um, these are myelin bundles within nerves. Uh, they're very poorly preserved. They're not nice and tight. They're a little bit nice and tight there, but you can see they're kind of off bundled there. When we're fixing uh, brain tissue or nerve tissue, uh, the best buffer to use is a phosphate buffer. However, phosphate uh, precipitates out osmium. So we have osmium precipitates all over the place uh, in this tissue. And so that's, you know, it's not a, something you want to publish. Um, I, you know, a lot of protocols say, you know, you, you fix your sample, you wash it with the buffer and you go into the uh, osmium. I usually have a water step between uh, the uh, osmium and the buffers just to make sure there's not buffer salts in there. Uh, and that's, I, over the years, it's really improved uh, my, my processing of tissues and cells. I don't really get osmium precipitates anymore. Urinal acetate, uh, again, we can get that uh, precipitated out in the cell, uh, as we saw here, uh, or on the surface, because after sectioning our tissues uh, or our hybrid models, we usually use ultramicrotomy with hybrid models as well, um, we will uh, stain the, uh, the sections themselves to add more contrast. And the two stains that are used there are, again, urinal acetate, uh, but also lead citrate. And uh, both of those can precipitate out. So here we're seeing um, in this image here, this is what urinal acetate will look like precipitated out onto a negative stain situation. Not really a hybrid model, but you'll, this is why you're seeing it more in the negative. Whereas in here, um, this is in the tissue itself, we're seeing these dense little uh, flecks. So this is what uh, uranium uh, precipitates uh, will look like, these little crystals. We get a uh, lead contamination as well. So we'll stain our uh, sections with lead citrate uh, that works especially well with the nuclei, uh, really helps to kind of bring out the, uh, the features there. Um, but lead citrate will react with CO2. Um, so when we're rinsing off our grid, if we use uh, water that hasn't been boiled, or if we breathe onto our, our grids, uh, breathe out our CO2, uh, we can end up with uh, lead precipitates on uh, top of the surface of the section. And that's really annoying for imaging. And again, will interrupt anything that's publication worthy. So you see these little densities. Um, we've got, these are our lead contamination. Sometimes they form crystals. You'll get big round crystals, little huge. Here we have a situation of both. We've got both UA, urinal acetate and lead precipitates. Uh, and there might even be some stuff here um, from uh, floating around in the water from sectioning. So you can, if you have dirty water in sectioning, that'll end up on your uh, sections as well. You know, remember we're on the nanoscale here. So we have to be very precise and very careful. How are we on time? Okay, wow, it's already quarter two. All right, so um, this is good because uh, I wanted to wrap things up here. Um, mitigating these artifacts. So here's where our sales pitch comes in. Um, you know, come talk to us. We'll help you design your experiment for your hybrid model. We have a lot of uh, tools going on. Um, I, it's a bit too, um, there's too much to discuss here because everybody's project is different. When it comes to uh, biological samples though, we can deal either on the, um, cryogenic end uh, with these four, or um, if we're doing chemical processing, we have an automated uh, sample processor, which can be a bit more reliable than benchtop processing if you're not real experienced with that. Um, so we have to set this up with our reagents, um, but with most samples, usually, especially tissue samples, this is a plug and play solution. Well, it's not so much plug and play for us, um, but when you have your sample in there, once everything is set, you can press go and it will process, it will go through most of the process for you. Um, for doing um, high pressure freezing, so we can high pressure freeze our samples and freeze substitute our, our uh, samples. Uh, what that means is that we're freezing the samples very, very fast. Um, we're um, moving the nucleation point of, of uh, water crystals um, so that we can freeze them uh, vitreously without you know, damaging the samples. And we have to be very careful about that. So we have um, a 
instrument here to prepare our samples to go into the high pressure freezer, which then go into the um, free substitution, or they can go from the high pressure freezer directly into say cryo SEM um, or even cryo ultramicrotomy if, if your sample requires it. We never just wanna freeze our samples with liquid nitrogen though. Um, that is a, a very poor cryogen because we have that light and frost effect. You know, if you spill a little liquid nitrogen on yourself, not a big deal because there's always that microscopic layer of air between you and the nitrogen, it'll just flow right off. Um, what we're using in plunge freezing is liquid ethane and liquid ethane is, a, a, it's actually not as cold as uh, liquid nitrogen, but it's a much, much better cryogen because it does not have the light and frost effect. Uh, that is not something you want to get on your skin because it will stick and burn. Um, with uh, liquid ethane, usually we're plunging a, a grid, uh, which is a very, very thin membrane, and that's frozen very quickly, very rapidly in the ethane. And from there, we can go into a cryo TEM holder and into a microscope um, for more bulk samples. And what I mean by bulk samples is uh, 1.5 millimeters by like 100 microns. So that's, that's our bulk, right? So this is for high pressure freezing. Um, and so that is what I was saying uses our, our, our high pressure jet of liquid nitrogen um, to, I just said, don't use liquid nitrogen, but this is a different situation where we're, we're, we're treating that with a high pressure situation. Um, but that's what we're using for our bulk uh, sample prep for cryo. Okay, um, so uh, I wanted to open up the floor here for a little Q and A. Um, I guess I'll see if there's anything in the chat, nothing in the chat. Um, okay, so anybody have any well, questions just, for me? That, yeah, one just popped up. And also, if there's Great. not many people, you can also feel free to unmute yourself. If you'd like to ask yeah. a question. Yeah, please. Uh, let's see here. I'll put you all up here. Okay. Um, so there's one in the chat for you, Eric. Ah, okay. Let's see here. Um, can we find DNA threads using today's high-end uh, TM? Of course, X-ray crystallography is the best tool for that. Okay, so yes, um, I have worked with uh, DNA threads um, and um, uh, like telomere heads. Um, this is a situation not necessarily in the tissue. Um, I've worked with people that have um, either uh, extracted these or, or kind of grown them on their own. Um, and when deposited onto a grid, I used a, a sample preparation technique called tungsten shadowing. So when you uh, are preparing a sample for maybe SEM, you might know to use like a sputter coater uh, or an E-beam situation. And what we're doing with this uh, tungsten shadowing is the, the uh, DNA is on the grid and instead of going, you know, line of sight directly down onto it, which we might do with some carbon, uh, the source of the um, tungsten is going to be off to the side. And we, there's a very specific angle. I think it's like uh, seven or eight degrees, something like that, where you want to situate the, uh, the uh, grid uh, relative to your source of the tungsten. Uh, and that gets um, uh, not sputtered. Um, I guess uh, either e-beamed or um, like through an arcing situation, like a carbon arc um, onto the grid. And so it, it creates like this shadow. So we, we're, I don't know, we're not maybe directly imaging the DNA, but we're also, we're doing it through, um, uh, you know, an, an indication of this, this tiny little uh, strip of, of density and it, it forms up both sides. So you, you do get to actually see it. And it does actually look like just one line of, of DNA along with the, the telomere structure. There are people that have uh, tried to do it with cryo uh, EM. Cryo EM is very, very challenging with the TEM aspect of it anyways. Um, when you need to look at a very, very small structure, you need very, very high resolution, right? But which requires a, an EM uh, you know, of the 300 kb variety. But the higher up in voltage you go with an EM, uh, the lower the contrast is. And so you know, everything's a trade-off in, in EM. You, know, you, you, you change one parameter to gain something, but you're losing something else usually. Um, and so, you know, very low voltage uh, EM is great for, um, oops, is great for um, uh, contrast. Um, but when you're looking at high resolution work, you'll need to do some post-processing in that as well. So there's a whole organization, or not, there's a whole slew of people, especially um, crystallographers, uh, protein crystallographers and single particle people that are doing very, very high resolution uh, cryo EM work. They're very hardcore cryo people. 
Um, and they use all sorts of filters and medium filters um, and, and processing and reconstruction uh, to uh, generate their, their uh, sample. So, you know, protein crystallography is kind of along that line of uh, where, you know, you have a very, very small molecule to work with. Um, so that's a, a field uh, that requires a lot of attention. And so doing like one of those projects is, is like a, you know, two, three year postdoc project or, or graduate student project. Um, I'm sure there are other ways of, of imaging it that I'm missing that I'm not up to date on. Um, but thank you for asking the question. Uh, did, did that answer it? Yeah, we're up all the way up to noon now. Yep. Um, so, I mean, if there are any questions, feel free to chime in. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you everyone for you know, sitting and listening to my talk. I hope you've learned something today. Uh, I hope you've seen something new and, and can take that on to your research. Um, if you have any other further questions though, please reach out to me, um, eric-roth uh, at northwestern.edu. Um, you can find me on the Nuance website under our BioPrio uh, tab. Um, and uh, you know, I'm on ResearchGate. You can see me on Google uh, Scholar and all, all of the different stuff I've done collaborations on um, with people over the years. Um, uh, if it's some part of a mouse or some part of tissue or some different type of cell or a C. elegans or um, Drosophila or polymers, nanoparticles, MOFs. I've worked with a lot, a lot of different things. I, I rarely work on the same thing uh, from day to day. Um, so, you know, jack of all trades, uh, master of none, but nonetheless, that, that uh, high exposure um, has really, I found very beneficial and has made my, my position a lot of fun. Um, so thank you again for uh, listening to my talk and, and please reach out if you need any assistance. I'm happy to help, I really am. I love what I do here.